Hey everyone, this is a short lecture on Perry's dialogue on personal identity and immortality. Now, this is going to be a really short lecture compared to the amount of information and argumentation that's in Perry's dialogue. It's a really rich dialogue, there's a whole lot going on, lots of argumentative twists and turns, and so I'm only going to be handling just the basics of the various um, moves that happen in the dialogue. Um, so this is really um, only meant to be, as the lectures always are, just a kind of companion to the reading, not to replace it by any means. Um, so, Perry's dialogue. Um, the goal within the dialogue is for Miller to convince Wirab that it's at all possible to survive death. So the person survives the disintegration or death of the body. And um, the way that this ends up coming out is that we get a number of proposals by Miller and later on Cohen, proposals for what it means for a person to persist through time, to be the same person across time, and if they can get a theory on that that works, then they can show that a person can persist across time even when the body has failed or disintegrated or whatever. Um, that's the connection between personal identity and immortality. So on the first night, we get the view from Miller that personal identity consists in a person having the same soul over time. And so we can call this the same soul view of personal identity. And this is something that uh, Wirub even ends up convincing Miller can't really be correct. And it's not that there aren't souls. Uh, at the end of the dialogue, I think it's still true that Miller believes in souls and Wirub doesn't believe in souls. But the point is that um, you can't explain what makes the person the same person across time by saying that they have the same soul. And the reason is that we have really no access to a soul. We don't know, um, you know how to see a soul, how to touch or taste it. We can't really infer the existence of the same soul through someone's behavior. And so for all we know, um, you know, people are getting new souls all the time or something like that. So we can't, we can't really explain um, when someone's the same person by saying they have the same soul because we can't ever check or know whether someone has the same soul or a different soul. So that's not going to um, to fly as an explanation for personal identity over time. Now on the second night we get a little more sophisticated view and this is what we're going to call the memory view. And the memory view first of all um, relies on the idea that we can talk about person stages. So you have to think of a person as a kind of thing that extends through time, and each time slice is a person's stage. And the memory view says that what makes a person the same person across time is that um, there are a series of person stages, and the person stages are connected by memories. That is, each future stage remembers being some past stage. Now, um, this is kind of like you know, you have like a stack of person stages or something like that, and the glue that's holding them together is memory. And the second night of the dialogue is devoted pretty much entirely to this idea and variations on it, and I'm not going to talk about all the variations on it, but one thing to say um, straight up is that Wirab thinks the memory view is not going to work either. It can't explain uh, what makes a person the same person across time. And I'm going to use an example here that's a little bit different from what happens in the text, but I think it's going to make possibly more sense. So um, think about the transporter from Star Trek. This is something that um, was in the discussion boards. And um, the point of the transporter question was not to ask about whether you would want to take a transport or whether it could really exist in real life. Um, we know that it doesn't exist in real life, it's just a made-up example. The point is to be able to think um, with the aid of this example, and um, I want to talk about that example um, being applied to myself. So suppose I enter the transporter, and what it does is it scans my body, and then it makes um, like a template or a copy of the information of the configuration of particles in my body, and then it destroys my body, and sends the information off to a planet somewhere where I'm reconstituted out of um, the matter on that planet. Now, there are two ways to look at what's going on in the transporter case. So the first way is like, I think we're supposed to think it's like on Star Trek, for example. Um, we just think about it as 
uh, I'm stepping in at one place, I'm getting off at another place, I'm just being transported. It's kind of like the subway, only way more high tech. You know, um, the fact that my body is disintegrated doesn't really have anything to do with it. Um, I'm the person who walks in, and then I'm the person who steps onto the new planet somewhere else. Now, the second way of thinking about it is a little bit different. It's that when I step into the transporter, the machine kills me, and then it sends a copy of my information to another planet where it creates a kind of copy of me, but that copy is not really me. It's just some new person that looks exactly like me and has memories that would have been my memories if I hadn't been destroyed. So which of these two scenarios is right? I mean, which way of looking at the transporter case is right? Is it that um, I survived the whole time and on the other end of the, the transporter down on the planet, I actually remember being up in the starship before I got transported? Or is it more accurate to say that um, some new person got created who only seems to have memories of being me but doesn't really have memories of me because it's a new person? Um, that's the example. And the point of this is that Weirub is complaining about the memory view that it can't tell us which way of looking at things is correct. It can't tell us whether I'm the person on the other end of the transporter or whether it's some copy of me that only seems to have my memories. And the problem with that is that a theory of personal identity should tell us whether I persist or not through time, through the transportation. But the memory of you can't tell us this, and so the memory of you is going to be a bad theory of personal identity. Now, at the end of the second night, that's what Weirub thinks. Miller and Cohen aren't quite so convinced, but she is adamant that this view is going to be bad. Now, finally, we have the third night of the dialogue. And the third night, um, Miller and Cohen are back on the memory view again, but they want to add something to it. They want to say, okay, personal identity is preserved um, just like the memory view says, except that also, in addition to the person status having memories and so on, we stipulate that the same brain is involved. So we can call this view the memory plus brain view. Um, the memory plus brain view is something that, in a way, Wirab agrees with, because she thinks that she is just um, the one human individual. Except that she thinks that when Miller and Cohen adopt the memory plus brain view, then they've lost all the advantages that the memory view alone, without the same brain stipulation, um, appeared to have. So... What Miller and Cohen are doing, she thinks, when they adopt the memory plus brain view, is they're kind of undercutting their own position, and they're making their position weaker. Now, um, once again, I'll leave it to you to look at the text and see what's going on there. What were those advantages that they thought the memory of you had? What does Weirub think that they are losing when they adopt the memory plus brain view? But by the end of the dialogue, Miller and Cohen wind up sort of so confused and so unsure of what to say, then they think, well, maybe this personal identity stuff isn't really what's important. Um, maybe what's important is just figuring out who you like and who your friends are and so on, and not worrying about whether they're the same person through time or not. But by that point in the dialogue, Weirab has died, and that's the close of the dialogue.